which I'm looking forward to. Plague makes each of us the possible carrier. Um, okay, start my video. Okay, I guess so. Um, of death to others. And all those others, the possible bringers of death to us. And thus it, the measures it requires and the panic it stirs, weaken the very communities we need to live and to live well. Those as large as a country, its institutions and regions and cities, as be, excuse me, as medium as its fellowships and associations and villages, and as small as its families of man, wife, and children, and its friendships. We should stay away from each other, but can we bear to? Only beasts and gods can live outside the city, solitary like Polyphemus, observes Aristotle. True, Nietzsche added, or a philosopher, who has the best of friends among the dead. But as he, living solitarily, came to suffer, and perhaps see, not for long, live solitary, until, of course, he became, he uh, entered that uh, uh, utter solitude of madness. Moreover, the great dead can be appreciated together. As Louise Cowan, the founder of the University of Dallas, with her husband Don, used to say, Yes, reading great books makes you melancholy, and that's why we do it together. And when suddenly the chance to teach Russian novel, not taunt since her exile, came my way, I consulted her. It would have been the third preparation. And she said, well, Michael, you can always read it alone, but it's different, isn't it, when you read with students? That settled it. And though it was a third preparation, and read, read we did, Anna, Brothers, and War and Peace, best class I've ever been in, and most consequential in three ways. Many thanks, then, to this time of enforced solitude for reminding us of some of the great books set in plague times, and suggesting that their study might sustain us in somewhat similar times today of pan-virus, pan-panic, and pan-oppression. The only group that truly welcomes this are the mothers, our ancestors in the heavens, who were at last pleased that we're washing our hands as they told us to do for, for years. In addition to great Thucydides, there is Procopius's history, Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year, Mons' Magic Mountain, and Camus' The Plague. Best, however, might be Alessandro's The Betrothed. Set in Lombardy, not this last winter, but in the 17th century. <coughs> it covers the whole horror of that plague in whose deadly general um, a deadly grip, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, all suffered, many dying. Ah, come on. Um, this thing has a will of its own, adjusting the size of things. Sorry. Um, his deadly grip all suffered, many dying, most failing in virtue, and some showing as bright as a human soul ever has. All their experiences ask us, how would you do? No book shows how little we care to find out the truth, how little we know ourselves, how even less we know others, how rumor, prejudice, and illusion rule our world and us. At bottom, at home, safe in our bed, we are just as frightened as in the plague, panicked, fleeing, we might become just as furious, even murderous, as the mob around us. And yet Manzoni understands everyone, feels for each of us, even to the most evil of us, extends an understanding animated by love, as God must, we hope, do for us, 
and rejoices in how virtuous, despite our trembling, we can become. The betrothed gives us the best portraits of daily cowardice, saintly love, and astonishing conversions I know of. The turning of meekness itself in the person of Gertrude gradually into confirmed evil is truly unique, not equaled even by the rapid transformation of confident Othello into the suspicious murderer of his beloved wife. We can barely believe it's happening that resolute Gertrude is going to yield, agree to take the veil, but we cannot doubt it, only be astonished and then horrified at what she then does, turning trembling Lucia over to thugs sent by the unnamed. And yet the conversion of the eminently evil unnamed to the good is more remarkable than Augustine's or Paul's. If this can happen, then a Hitler, a Stalin, a Mao might repent. Portraying evil is not easy. Shakespeare's Goneril, Richard III and Iago are an unprecedented achievement. And yet, as Simon Weil said, the really hard thing to portray is goodness. Hearing of Federico Cardinal Borromeo, so strong and so loving, it is impossible not to want to go visit him right now. And just as the unnamed does, seized by mortal thoughts, sick of his life, stirred to hope, and welcomed by Borromeo. Yes, how I too would like to hear he's preaching nearby. We want such heroic goodness to help us, and maybe some good young reader one day will want more than help, will aspire to become such a hero, the one at the funeral who bucks everyone else up, as Jordan Peterson says. How finely Manzoni discriminates among the goods, setting out the latter of them from the hardy Agnesia, the heroic but ever struggling Father Cristoforo, and on to the superlative Cardinal Borromeo, who makes doing good seem effortless. And it almost is, for it springs from intrepid love. How good in the cause of good in other men. Can there be a Christian prince? Can one be both priest and ruler? The existence of this good Cardinal Federico refutes all those such as Machiavelli who hold that no statesman could be a saint and all those such as Tolstoy who claim no saint could be a statesman. Notable too are the discrimination of vices from the evil of the unnamed which shines with what one must admit is greatness onto the ordinary thuggishness of Don Rodrigo. And finally, to all the habitual weaklings whose evil effects can nevertheless be considerable. The daily cowardice of Vicar Father Abandio, who rises each morning already anxious to make it back to supper and bed prevents the lovers Renzo and Lucia from marrying. And they don't get to marry till the end of the novel, 600 pages. When my friend Mikael Waldstein first recommended the novel to me saying it's the, it's, it's the best book on marriage. And when halfway through, it seems Renzo and Lucia are never going to marry. I asked him, so the best marriage is the one longest postponed? Such pusillanimity of the vicar may show the mirror to even the bravest reader and well deserves the stern and yet loving rebuke of the cardinal. This range of virtue and of vice should instruct us, but it can be provoking. A great work is bound to disappoint almost all readers, including the good. Just as many contemporary clerics were offended by the trembling Don Abandio, as many contemporary patriots were offended by the goodness of Cardinal Borromeo. Each issue of a good journal, thought Charles Pagui, ought to offend a portion of its regular readers and a different portion each issue. <laughs> Compromise offends the staunchly committed, but maybe they're right. 
Maybe one must choose one way this time, next time another. It is a nice question whether prudence or courage is the comprehensive virtue, whether gratitude is the fundamental one and how they're related to faith, to hope and to love. And the betrothed will help us to think about these things. The wretched condition of divided and oppressed Italy portrayed in the novel so-called for self-governing unification and the novel so promoted it by giving Italians a language to share, the Risorgimento thanked Mazzoni. Yet how can this be? The betrothed teaches that the irremediable sorrows of our lives in the extreme of famine, of war, and of plague, which kingle charity in some and malice in more others, calls above all for the risorgimento of Christ in us all. Would Menzoni have us sing, we shall overcome, or Kyrie Elison? And if, as it seems, both, how do they go together? Just a few years after the first version, Menzoni took a rare trip and at the Genoese frontier, an old soldier poked his head in the carriage and recited paragraph after paragraph from the novel, as Italians have since. In the version he produced 14 years later in Tuscan to create a shared national tongue. For that and the novel's other contributions to the unification of Italy, <clears throat> the nation esteemed him, Victor Emmanuel added a pension, and a year after his death, Verdi honored him with his requiem. Today, the book is required in school, but Italians do come to love it later, and they will judge you by it. If you know Dante, you're considered educated. But if you know Manzoni, they will embrace you, and on the train, opening that fragrant basket, bid you eat with them. Yet the book is hardly known elsewhere, hardly studied, and no college with an integrated curriculum that I know of includes it, not even a Catholic one. There are fine things in o Flannery O'Connor, Walter Percy, Evelyn Waugh, but as Miloš once noted, few heroes in modern literature. And the betrothed, there are three heroes. Need help dying well? Then this might be the book for you, as it is for me. And especially recommended doing so together, as my, and I especially recommend doing so together as my seminar of mostly former students in fall of 2019. And now we turn um, to one of those participants in the seminar, uh, to uh, Christy Masters for uh, her reflections on justice and love. Um, is, did I get the order right? Yes, <laughs> um, thank you, Dr. Platt. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I'm gonna share a screen here. Um, let's see. Can, uh, okay. This is not a full PowerPoint presentation. It's just something to look at here. <laughs> and, uh, okay. So, um, so my uh, contribution to this panel is on justice and love. And it kind of reminded me of a picture that Alessandro Manzoni gave of um, how he was trying to keep all of his characters in line and it was like trying to herd guinea pigs. So I hope that I don't give that impression <laughs> as I present my uh, paper. Okay, so justice and love. To Verde, Alessandro Manzoni's The Betrothed offered consolation to the whole of humanity. Italo Calvino declared that it is our most widely read political book. Can we attempt to reconcile the lovingly human and the science of governing in what seemed to be soberingly factual digressions in his romantic masterpiece? Manzoni is able to describe the formation of a mob 
with an intellectual and historic honesty not only applied to the events in the city in a state of rebellion, but to the inward struggles and differing thoughts of the people, citizens, and magistrates caught in its current. He is profoundly sympathetic in his description of the inward man, yet leaves no sin unturned. He condemns the aberration of justice with passion in the column of infamy, yet does so without the condemnation of humanity. Manzoni combines love and justice with a duty to truth, creating an entirely different kind of political book and in a way that offers consolation to the soul. Manzoni chosen to write only historical reality and had he left out all but that which was recorded of the time period that he treats in his novel. Had he included only the strictest requirements of history as a genre and shunned the poetic, he would have been able to satisfy some but it is doubtful that he would have been able to offer a consolation to any. It is also doubtful that his work would be remembered for its profound and transformative political importance. His commitment to truth echoed in the Italian romantics combined his Christian faith and his idealism with an equally strong commitment to reason and logic and an innate desire to avoid deception of any kind. This commitment amplified the great struggle of using invention for art and poetry, while keeping honesty at the forefront of both the narrative and the discourse found in a historical novel. The reconciliation of recognizing that the poetic is an essential form of communication and pursuit of the good, the true and the beautiful. Manzoni shared, the art is art to the extent that it produces not just any effect, but a definitive one. And if this is so, the view that truth alone is beautiful is not only plausible, but profound. For the verisimilar, the raw material of art, once offered and accepted as such, becomes a truth that is altogether different from the real, but one that the mind perceives forever and one whose presence is irrevocable. Even still, struggle between the historical and the poetic is a difficulty that our author treats at length in his answer to this question and on the historical novel. The French philosopher, Paul Ricoeur, expressed that philosophical and poetic thought dwell on two different mountains. This is history and poetry do for Manzoni. But Manzoni and his betrothed finds a valley to connect the two, sometimes dwelling there and sometimes climbing up higher, scaling one precipice or the other, but always elevating the reader to a trusted friendship with the author and a firm security and assurance that he will not deceive. In the betrothed, Manzoni endeavors that truth be found equally in the valley and at the summits of either mountain, history or poetry. And for us readers, that the path is not difficult. It is somehow familiar and paved with courtesy. Maybe because he concerns himself not only with the events, the history of events, but the history of the human mind being a loving and just narrator of both. Manzoni rejects and patiently exposes tyranny of any kind, whether examples are to be found in the annals of history, in a parish priest, as he shows in Father Borromeo's entreaty to Don Abundio. He says, ah, if you had loved, as you must have loved your flock for so many years of pastoral labors, if you had put all your heart and your cares and your delight in them, then courage ought not to fail you in the moment of need, because love is bold. <laughs> in a nobleman or a city council, he found tyranny in both, in the laws themselves or in rulers who issued those edicts, in the heartlessness of a father, when he hesitated to even call a father, so concerned with his self-interest that he tyrannized his own daughter and forced her to be sequestered in a convent. In a mob or in our own minds where unsound ideas can rule our members with a frightening iron grip and drowning out all that is real or reasonable. He believed fervently in individual responsibility of all persons, whatever their station, and wrote to all as equals. He also did not fail to find virtue in all these possible and various places, beautiful acts of courage, charity, and wisdom. The socio-political implications of such a view brought a unification of purpose in all the classes and governing bodies. 
as individuals responsible for ourselves and all being equally and eventually answerable to the same heavenly authority, we simultaneously find ourselves on the same moral footpath, whether we be a citizen or a magistrate. We each then have equal interest in just laws, equal interest in fair trials, as well as equal interest in acts of charity and kindness. We have equal responsibility in resisting the illogical and suspicious tendencies that threaten us when we're in times of want or struggle, but also an equal interest in the miraculous transformation that forgiveness affords us all. What consolation and hope is found in the astonishing and yet profoundly personal and relatable change in the unnamed. The overarching guide of all is truth, but not one that is created or invented by us, rejecting the arbitrary and subjective tyrants of our time. Manzoni inextricably linked the verisimilar with the historical verifiable, whether it was human action or the human heart. For Calvino's declaration that the betrothed is Italy's most widely read political book, it cannot only be because Manzoni worked long and laboriously to help implement a single national language. Mm -hmm. Essential for the effective communication of thought, which in turn was essential to the unification of Italy. But because of the unification of history and poetry, the just and the loving, the moral and the beautiful, this understanding of human nature and human events put all of mankind on an equal dignified footing bringing a consolation and hope that comes with the freedom of thought and action inherent in this responsibility. As Manzoni gently reminds, to do good, one must first know what it is. When we read the betrothed, one comes away with a profound meaning, feeling of having met the good and walked together for a little while. Thank you. Oh, 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 I want to think about a lot of paragraphs. Uh, um, and uh, you, the way you brought together the intrepid love as a as a, a uniting these things. Oh boy. Um, um, well, I guess we're uh, we just move along. Um, 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 if somebody um, wants to put an immediate question to Christy, um, and, um, um, or we. Well, I just want to offer a comment that I, in particular, liked, Christy, the way you um, described Manzoni's devotion to to truth, not 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 necessarily truth with a capital T, but but um, uh, true propositions and 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 the, the the obligation to not be deluded, and it, it's it's the it dovetails exactly with 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 my presentation actually, and there's no question that that Manzoni. Um, uh, that was a huge uh, part of the uh, of, of the novel in all respects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Bob. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, um, um, Bob. Um, I'm next. Okay. Well, um, it's an honor actually to be asked to do this. Um, I'm not a scholar. Um, uh, unlike most of the participants in in the in the act, let me break in. We, we are eternally grateful to what Bob had to say about the bedding and the. Oh no no no! We're not going there. <laughs> My, it, but I just I just I need to tell a joke to, to follow on Chris Christie's witticism at the beginning, and it, it's because I'm not a scholar. Um, I, I feel a little bit like the story of of of. Um, Zsa, Zsa Gabor's fifth husband. Um, that may be dating myself, but, but um, on their honeymoon, the paparazzi approached him and um, uh, you know, said, well, how's it going? And his answer was great. He said, well, I know what's expected of me, but I'm not sure I can make it interesting. So that, that's my challenge today is to try to make this, um, uh, this interesting. And let, let me share um, if this works, do we have screen sharing? Not, no. not yet, but, but, oh. but at least with me. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to flip flip through this, but the topic is political economy in Manzoni's *The Betrothed*, which does tie into what what Christie was saying that he was you know, he meant to write a novel about political and also economic rights. Um, mm. So the uh, agenda is uh, you know, first to uh, give you my view of how the betrothed might fit as a core text, um, move to the, the details of the specific event that Manzoni describes in great detail and comments on directly in his own voice. Um, the, 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 the background to that and the actual events called the Tumulto di San Martino, uh, the Red Riots of, of uh, early November, 1628. I'll go through in detail Manzoni's analysis of the situation he's described and finally link it to uh, the tradition of classical political economy. The novel is a major component of 19th century European literature, sometimes compared to Dickens. I've, I've seen that in the course of my researchers here. And this does combine a powerful love story uh, with a historical novel of Milan and Northern Italy during the Thirty Years' War. It's most sharply focused on two events in Milan, the wheat dearth, called a famine in 1628, followed by the plague introduced by foreign invasions in the following two years. He treats as consequences of both, he treats both as consequences of foreign control and local mismanagement. And he notes pervasively the irrational and dangerous passions in the populace arising from and exacerbating these forces. He shows us how a, even a good man, his protagonist Renzo can be caught up in a mob mentality from common but misguided beliefs. I, I'm, I'm speculating that potential links to studies uh, would, would be through European history, political philosophy, and economics. The book was written uh, during and influenced the struggle for independence and unification of Italy. It incorporates classical liberal political ideas with the advocacy of nationalism and it consciously includes ideas of classical political economy initiated by Adam Smith and Wealth of Nations and including Manzoni's contemporaries whom he knew, Frederick Bastiat and Jean-Baptiste Say. The background to the events he's concerned with um, are as follows. The protagonist, Renzo, has had to flee to Milan from rural Lake Como after opposing the local corrupt strongman's interference in his marriage plans. He arrives, good timing, just as a wheat shortage has reached a critical point, the Tumulto di San Martino, November 11th and 12th of 1628. This happened to be the second year in a row of bad wheat harvest, although a bad harvest is actually a frequent occurrence at the time about every four years in pre-industrial Europe. So it wasn't, and, and Manzoni notes this, unexpected. But the system had become fragile and very sensitive for a number of reasons to small disruptions adversely affecting supply. So a combination of uh, weather variants, uh, population stress um, as, as a long-term recovery from, from, from the Black Death, uh, and changes in agriculture resulted in a supply shock to the supply of wheat, a physical shortage, a dearth. But the events in Milan in 1628 did not exhibit, in fact, the excess mortality as in the severe 1590s famines and later in the mid 17th century. So uh, Manzoni's observations are in effect, although he doesn't say this, uh, a, manageable, a manageable situation. And the tragedy is that it wasn't managed right when it could have been. The much more severe famines in Northern Italy in the 1590s had led to increased institutional control over markets and agriculture through uh, the Anoni or the Provisioning Council and their Calmieri, 
which were reference prices that they would publish uh, as effectively the, the approved prices for commodities. So in, rea in reaction to the supply shock, institutional failure combined with the human failure of popular psychology to create the severe crisis of 1628. The tumulto de San Martino. Renzo is unaware that there's a wheat shortage when he arrives. In fact, his first impression, ironically, is of excess, since he observes as though it were snow, a layer of white flour all over the streets. And later, later a pile of fresh bread loaves. He thinks he's found the land of milk and honey. Then he observes a man, a woman, and a child hauling away huge bags of flour and spilling it. So he thinks this is great. And he takes three loaves from the pile for himself. Now, this to me was a, a faint echo of Benjamin Franklin's not dissimilar arrival in Philadelphia in 1723. Um, he, 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 he buys, because they're so cheap, uh, three loaves and then discovers for himself the limits of satisfaction from cheap abundance. Uh, I could not resist connecting that to Franklin. But Renzo quickly discovers that in fact, there is an actual shortage, which has led to the vicious bread riots in Milan of the Tumulto di San Martino. Manzoni has Renzo, quote, hold the common opinion that the scarcity of bread had been caused by the speculators and bakers, and that any method would be justifiable in taking it from them, those wreckers and hoarders. So Renzo, almost against his better judgment, finds himself caught up in the passion of the mob. The mob belief that there is no actual shortage. Bakers and farmers are withholding supplies intentionally. There's extensive looting and destruction of bakeries and wheat and flour distribution. And worst of all, the near lynching of a high official responsible for provisioning. Manzoni then describes in chilling detail the ransacking of a especially large bakery after a mob has nearly killed bread delivery boys to seize what they have and then overwhelms a troop of halberdiers guarding the bakery. Renzo uh, follows the mob after this event to the house of the provision superintendent whom they plan to lynch, but then becomes horrified and actually assists in the high chancellor's rescue of the superintendent. But the chancellor is able to appease the mob only by openly promising normal supplies of bread, which instantly turns their wrath to exhilaration. Renzo, again caught up in this, becomes mob famous after making a lengthy, impassioned speech about the treachery of the ruler's verbal skills and advocates more mob action to overcome them. Ha, he gets his though because he's later tripped in a tavern by a secret police agent who has, who has followed him. He's arrested the next day and escapes, but has to flee to Milan as a wanted man. And these pictures are, are, uh, are in one of the original editions of, of showing on the right, the attack on the superintendent in the middle, the ransacking of the bakery, and on the left, um, uh, hoarding and, and um, uh, excess uh, of, of, of uh, wheat flour. Manzoni's analysis, which he offers both by description and explicitly in chapter 28 in comment, the very first observation of Renzo, say Manzoni, in Milan is of sheer waste the waste of the scare resource when it's allocated by mob violence. Manzoni has Renzo note mentally that, quote, each one provided for himself in proportion to his inclination and power, giving blows in payments. At the ransack bakery, when Renzo hears that the presence of bread proves that there is uh, no scarcity, and seeing the scene of de devastation, he pauses and says, quote, this cannot be a good deed. If they treat the bakehouses this way, where will they make bread? Indeed, <laughs> the ruling authorities actually confirm 
the irrational insistence that there is no shortage by instituting price controls and rationing. The city populations and the provisioning councils had mutually reinforcing delusions and expectations that supply and price could be controlled by fiat. Manzoni says, quote, the mob thought it could create times of plenty by looting and incendiarism. The government thought it could prolong them by the threat of the lash and the galley. Manzoni in his direct comment shows how mismanaged the crisis is and how dangerous the situation had become. In the first bad harvest, he notes that the entire reserve stock, first year, uh, reserve stockpile had been consumed, leaving no margin for error. Excessive taxes had been levied on farmers and farms were abandoned. Military requisitions increased the shortage and raised market prices, uh, another kind of tax. The shortage produced what Mandoni explicitly calls a salutary increase in price. He wanted, he thought an increase in price was desirable, which we'll see uh, is, is exactly in accordance with economic theory. But the price of bread is fixed at a level required at the former market price of wheat. So price of bread fixed at what the former price of wheat was, but now it's doubled. And it's so unworkable that the officials are forced to relent, which simply further enrages the mob. The price fixing discourages production, induces hoarding, and prevents importation of wheat from where there are normal supplies. The, the, the city states of Northern Italy after the 1590s had established trade relations as far as the Baltic and the Crimea for bringing food into the peninsula. Manzoni says, quote, all the official measures in the world, however vigorous they may be, cannot lessen man's need for food nor produce crops out of season, quote, these measures certainly were not calculated to attract imports from other areas where there might conceivably be a surplus. Rationing requires, he reveals, massive control of every family's situation just to prevent fraud. Quote, first, fix a moderate price that everybody could reach. Give a note to every family, a ration card, in proportion to the number of mouths to go and get bread at bakehouses. Quote, the plan was entirely founded on paper, pen, and ink, and that to put it in execution, the first thing must be to get everybody's name. The state has to know everything about you in order to have this be effective. It also requires no arbitrage, meaning you can't get your ration and resell it to somebody else willing to pay more for it. The proclamation issued stated, quote, all who had any corn or flour in their houses were forbidden to buy either one and forbidding everyone else to purchase more than would be required for two days. It gets worse. <laughs> uh, the, the proclamations contained orders to public officers, quote, and to all other persons to inform against offenders, orders to magistrates to make strict search in any houses which might be reported to them, together with fresh commands to the bakers to keep their shops well provisioned with bread. A nice trick if you can do it. And he emphasizes this with italics, quote, under pain in case of failure of five years in the galleys or even greater penalties at the will of his excellency. Uh, he, he notes snidely that uh, if this could actually have been executed, uh, Milan would have had more uh, sailors in, in galley ships than Britain had in the Royal Navy. The fixed price lower than the market then attracts mobs of vagrants from outside Milan, which in turn creates pestilent conditions and disease. The authorities are nonplus. They, they then just forbid taking bread out of the city with draconian, the draconian punishments, including public flogging. So of course, a recession is induced. Manzoni, Manzoni says, quote, rags and misery had invaded almost every rank. The nobility were seen walking in modest or even dirty and shabby clothing, 
Some, because the common causes of misery had affected their fortunes to this degree, or even giving a finishing hand to fortunes already much dilapidated. It wasn't just the poor. Everybody was, was, was being affected adversely. Fundamentally, all these unintended evils flow from a failure to balance supply and demand through the price mechanism. Manzoni says explicitly, quote, there is in fact a necessary connection between all those strange provisions. Each provision was an inevitable consequence of the one before, and all followed logically from the first, which fixed a price for bread, which was so far removed from the real price by which we must, uh, uh, by which we mean that which would have resulted from the relationship of supply and demand. It does not get any more classic or fundamental than that. Um, I, 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 I've probably gone about uh, 15 minutes or so. Um, optionally, um, I can, I can uh, talk about uh, with, you can't do economics without charts, <laughs> um, explaining some, some fundamental concepts. But in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just cut to the chase here. Um, well, no, no, um, we don't have, um, I don't think we have anybody listening. I'd love to hear more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, please. Uh, you know, I'll have a question about the rationing in my childhood um, of, for World War II, but, you know, we'll get to that. And, uh, uh, well, yes, the propaganda was that there were no black markets in World War II in the U.S., which was factually wrong and known to be wrong at the time. <laughs> anyway, the, the two fundamental economic concepts that I, that I would um, call attention to are, um, and here's a picture of them, deadweight loss from price fixing and diminishing marginal utility of consumption. Oh, sorry. Deadweight loss is the term applied to the inefficiency that results from price fixing above uh, more than the loss of value to both supply and demand side from the actual physical shortage. There's going to be a loss because we don't have as much wheat as we used to have. But with price fixing, you get that and even, and even more, deadweight loss. The physical shortage means the quantity produced must be lower than the prior period both supply and demand curves should shift in reaction to that. So the demand side and supply side have both lost the surplus value they had compared to prior period. Quantity is lower and price is higher. The market clears though at that higher price without the waste of violence, hoarding and draconian enforcement. And rationing overhead Remember, we have to know everything about everybody and arbitrage seeking or reselling uh, costs avoided, including enforcing against them. So if we, if we go back to the left-hand chart, it, it's too busy to explain in, in five minutes, but, but basically the pink, the pink shaded part is the value to consumers and it, and it changes depending upon um, uh, the, the, the price and quantity um, uh, equilibrium. The blue is the producer's value that he gets. And the yellow is when we price fix, the yellow is the dead weight loss. Now, both of them have lost some of their prior surplus, I'm, but I'm, addition, there's an additional loss that is just waste. Um, uh, to, uh, I don't see on the screen this. I see the picture with Hayek and, and oh, others. Oh, oh, but, oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry. Can you uh, I need to go to uh, move it along. And um, yeah, um, let's see. Looks like we're on page ten, and and you need to move us to. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, that 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 that's it. Um, uh, let's see. How do how do I get back to? Um, no. I see a little bar on the edge. Um. And little 
I, I, I want to switch the 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 uh, the screen to another uh, the screen sharing. Oh, well, and figure out how to do that. You might you might have to end screen sharing and then start it again. How do I end screen sharing? Uh, it should be the same bottom uh, button in the middle on the bottom. It's not. We're up at the top. It says stop share. Maybe. Don't see it. All right, we can we can deal with that in the in. The, uh, let's see, what's this? No, I'm sorry. Um, uh, let me let me just proceed without pictures, and we can come come back to that once we figure. Oh, here we are. Okay, share screen. That worked. Um, let's see. Yeah, I went ahead and stopped your screen sharing. So if you can. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, follow Dr. Nussmeier's advice and um, go to whatever page. I take it you want a browser window or is it a, a document? It's it's a document. Great. So go ahead and go to that document and I have. Then hit share screen again. Yeah, so that should work. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Share. How's that? Do we have a pretty picture? Yeah, it's oh. working now. Let me see a chart. Okay, sorry about that. Dead weight loss. You you lose even more than you were going to when you have price fixing. And in the picture on the left, um, Q sub zero is the original happy state of affairs. The green line is the the happy state of affairs pre pre famine. Uh, like the um, the red line is the, the red line that's not dashed is the uh, demand curve in that happy time. So Q sub zero, where they intersect is the quantity at the market price. And P sub zero, which equals P sub two is the price. So that's our original price and our original quantity. When we have a shortage, what's going to happen is that the su supply curve goes from solid green to solid blue. They can't supply anymore. So it all shifts up and to the left. Now the equilibrium quantity is Q1 it, less and the price <laughs> P1, that's less. Now in response to that, the demand curve is likely to shift too. That gets us to Q2 uh, and I'm sorry, in response to price fixing, um, the, the, the uh, a demand curve will shift and the, um, the new equilibrium is at P2, which is equal to the old happy price, but the quantity is yet even less because the demand shift that the supply curve will shift also, suppliers can't supply. And what's left is that the pink and the blue are, are the surplus that, that the value <laughs> that suppliers and the demand side were gaining from the exchange, from the transaction. And it is reduced, but the yellow is a further reduction from waste, the dead weight loss. Mm -hmm. Let me move on. <laughs> um, <laughs> second, I mean, now, this, this is not something that, that Manzoni knew about. The, these these uh, concepts were elaborated much, much later, but that's what he's talking about when he, when he describes the chaos during the Tumulto, just waste. Diminishing marginal utility is how the demand side subjectively values goods as more and more are consumed. From any given level, the next unit of consumption is valued less or has less utility. So, oh, uh, sorry. That's on the right. So on the, on the X axis, we have the units of consumption of whatever it is. And I've just said, you know, bl blue line for bread and red wine for uh, line for wine. You can see that in each case, the subjective value or well being, the utility, as you consume more, goes up. But each time you consume another unit, 
its, its rate of going up gets lower and lower and lower. In the case of bread, when you don't have any bread, you have no utility, no value, no, no satisfaction. As soon as you get your first unit of consumption, the value goes up immediately, hugely. The second, even more so, but at three units, and these are just arbitrary, I just did this for illustrative purposes, uh, it's off. That's what Benjamin Franklin found out. He had three loaves of bread and could only eat one when they were so cheap and he bought them in Philadelphia. Uh, beyond that, it, you may actually have negative incremental utility. It goes bad. You have to store it <laughs> with wine or automobiles or machine guns. It might be different. That's the red uh, sort of standard, um, uh, still declining, but not, but not increasing as steeply for low consumption and then dropping off at satiation. Hmm. What does that mean? It means that both the poor and affluent uh, are, are, are going to, in effect, merge uh, utility preferences in response to the supply shock. The affluent will not outconsume the poor because they have the same utility for bread and, and, and because they can afford it, they will, they will shift consumption after satiation to wine. Mm -hmm. the, the poor, on the other hand, um, will be able to, uh, they'll be at the end of their, of their budget constraint, but uh, they, they don't need to have the kind of consumption implied by hoarding in order to have satisfactory utility. Now, they won't have enough left over for wine, but they didn't anyway. So in effect, because of diminishing marginal utility and different for low value uh, uh, commodities like bread compared to higher value like wine, uh, in effect, there's, there's, there's a harmonization, even though there is less to go around. Again, a, a concept that um, was only developed after um, uh, Manzoni's time. <laughs> Uh, now, Dolan, can, can, can I shift back to another? Um, actually, I think I don't have to do that. Like, let me do this. All right. I'm sorry for that digression. It's <laughs> a little heavy going, but but um, uh, and requires a lot more explication. Uh, but to wrap it up, Manzoni had great interest in political economy and was well read. He read, was influenced by or reflected the ideas of classical liberalism and political economy. Adam Smith, to be sure, he actually in another document wrote about Adam Smith. Frederick Bastiat, whose economic sophisms, economic harmonies, that which is seen and unseen most famously, um, he describes the common unawareness of the intricacy of economic networks. Famously an essay that starts off with a question, how does Paris get fed if Paris is the stomach and explains at great length all the networks that make that possible. And because of what is unseen, it's common, he says, to blame observable producers when there's scarcity and higher prices, exactly as Manzoni describes. That piece say, his treatise on political economy uh, quite early in the game, uh, translated immediately to English, extremely popular in the US, extensive discussion of how supply and demand equilibrium is maintained through prices. Amazingly, John Locke, in a relatively recently discovered uh, very short monograph called Venditio, oh. describes how the, uh, argues how the just price is the current local market price. And in particular, in areas where there are shortage, the increased price reflecting the shortage induces imports to relieve the food shortage and is therefore in itself just. And finally, in the modern times, uh, Friedrich Hayek, Nobel Prize winner, who has extensive writings on emergent order, spontaneous organization of markets and prices as means of coordination and information about the values and scarcity of things. Also second order effects, there's no anthropomorphism. There's no red czar that's controlling everything. There's no individual person necessarily to blame for complex social phenomena. 
Now, um, I'll stop there. Uh, but when I, I'll distribute the paper and there's a wonderful poem done by an economist named Russ Roberts at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. Uh, this is an excerpt from it called It's a Wonderful Loaf that in a little bit of poetic doggerel describes all these points about uh, in effect the magic of having market participants um, uh, with no visible hands making it all come together. So thank you very much. I hope it was I'm sorry it was long. <laughs> oh, um, uh, thank you so much. And would you, a little detail, that um, treatise by Locke that was discovered, am I right? Is that the one that was discovered at St. John's College in Annapolis? I, it's possible. I don't know its provenance. It's only about four pages. It was, it was sort of- it's But it's very- because there was something um, in the last year or two that was discovered. No, I think I this is more like say, four or five years ago and, and was discovered. I well, in, 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 well, maybe I'll check. I'll check that out. I'll check that out. But but yeah, that out because we need to claim that as the achievement of people close to core curricula. Um, <laughs> yes, they're the kind indeed. of people who you know, discover such a thing. And there's a second example it's sometime in the last 10 years that it's a St. John scholar, I'll use a general word, that discovered a fish in the Mediterranean that Aristotle had described and scholars ever since had said never existed. <laughs> hip hip hooray for core curricula students. <laughs> and, uh, well, I've, I've got a, a lot of questions uh, you know, about that, but uh, um, um, we'll circle back around and, um, um, and uh, Tony, um, <laughs> um, go for it. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll attempt to put a bow on it, as they say. Um, so all, thank you to both Christy and uh, Bob so far for two very rich presentations that also, I think, illustrate the depth that Manzoni's Promessi Sposi has, because there were two rich presentations that that um, barely touched on one another, but in a good way, um, right? Um, you know, kind of in conversation with each other, but, but two very different topics. And so I also have to apologize. I'll take the opposite tack that Bob took. I'm a practicing academic. Um, and so I will attempt to avoid verbosity. And, uh, but this will be a very, um, an academic type presentation. I'll um, try to share with you my screen here and you will eventually see once it works um, a PowerPoint that'll be used to kind of guide us and you should be able to see it now. Can you see it? All right. Ah. <laughs> All right, so we will begin. Um, and as I said, uh, apologies uh prior here for being an academic but so uh you'll see the title we'll get to the title in a minute but there's no better literary tradition than the italian one for bringing to fruition the theme of this year's conference alas that is because italy is fertile territory for both the literary imagination and disease with the latter having inspired the former perhaps all too often from the Middle Ages to the 19th century and beyond, from Giovanni Boccaccio's Decameron to Matilde Serrao's Ventre di Napoli, The Belly of Naples, a lesser known collection written by the Greek and Italian journalist in the aftermath of the cholera epidemic of 1884. For her part, Serrao describes the poverty ridden and cholera filled Bassi, that is the ground level hovels inhabited by the poorest of the poor in Naples as infernal neighborhoods and this is the first quote, without air, without light, without hygiene, in which Neapolitans splash about in black water streams, scale mountains of trash, breathe in toxins and drink dirty water. The misery of its residents, she continues, is constitutional, organic, intense and profound. We as readers and interpreters of the Italian tradition and condition could be forgiving, forgiven for believing that misery, suffering, death, and poverty are indeed constitutional to the Italian experience. 
In his medieval Decameron, a work occasioned in its own time by the Black Death of 1348, Boccaccio writes that, and I quote, pestilence swept relentlessly on from one to the next, and that in the face of its onrush, all wisdom and ingenuity of man were unavailing, that of course did not stop them from trying, as we know. As an antidote, the author intends to offer 100 tales from ancient and modern times that will provide solace, succor, and diversion to those who need it. It is no surprise then that in the first 12 or so lines of the prologue, Boccaccio associates taking pity, avere compassione, on those facing difficulty, li afflitti, the afflicted, with being human, umana cosa, and uses the terms conforto and consolazioni, comfort and consolations. The very first line of the prologue reads thus, to take pity on people in distress is a human quality which every man and woman should possess, but it is especially requisite in those who have once needed comfort and found it in others. He puts a fine point on the reciprocal and thus communal nature of consolation. Consolation is required especially of those who have availed themselves of it in the past. The need for diversion and consolation is made manifest by Boccaccio's terrifying description of plague plagued, or is it plague plagued, Florence, that noble city whose beauty exceeds all others in Italy, he writes, for he observes that, and I quote, it was not merely a question of one citizen avoiding another and of people almost invariably neglecting their neighbors and rarely or never visiting their relatives, addressing them only from a distance, this scourge had implanted so great a terror in the hearts of men and women that brothers abandoned brothers, uncles their nephews, sisters their brothers, and in many cases wives deserted their husbands. But even worse and almost incredible was the fact that fathers and mothers refused to nurse and assist their own children as though they did not belong to them. And this is a screenshot of an article from January of last year when the, the virus was just taking hold in Wuhan and you don't need to be able to read Italian to see what's happening. A man walking on the street fell over and had a heart attack. And no one is giving him aid because they feared the contagion. So the, the headline reads, coronavirus in Wuhan, for fear, or out of fear, no one helps a man who's struck down by a heart attack in the street, right? Hmm. Boccaccio goes on to decry what I like to call social distancing ante literum. And we have it here, the second quote on this previous slide. And almost without exception, they took a single and very inhuman precaution, namely to avoid or run away from the sick and their belongings, by which means they all thought that their own health would be preserved. Spoiler alert, they were wrong. Like Boccaccio before her, in 1884, the journalist Serrao, too, ends her series on the belly of Naples, a Naples battered about by cholera with an exhortation against abandonment, especially of a populace so afflicted and in favor of community. And she writes, don't abandon Naples now that the cholera is over. Don't abandon it again, consumed by politics or current events. Don't let this city that we all must love agonize again. Don't leave it poor, dirty, ignorant, without work, without aid. Do not destroy in her, in Naples, the poetry of Italy. Boccaccio's insights into the inhumanity of a society confronting a public health crisis would find confirmation 500 years later in Alessandro Manzoni's splendid novel, Promessi Sposi, a tale of agape love, sacramental marriage, and mercy, in the midst of which erupts yet another bout with the plague, this time that which afflicted Northern Italy, as we've heard, in 1629 and 1630. I was about to use the term decimated in place of afflicted, but decimated, of course, means to be reduced by one-tenth. The mortality rate mm. overall in Italy during this period ranged from 30 to 43 percent, and in the city of Milan alone, the overall mortality rate was 74 percent. That's 7-4. Um, after a year with coronavirus, the overall mortality rate uh, to which coronavirus-attributed deaths have contributed is 0.08% of the population of the United States. That's three orders of magnitude less 
than that of the plague of 1629, 1630. Of course, the overall mortality rate was much higher back then. I allow that. But um, as Manzoni notes, the population of Milan was reduced from more than 250,000 to little more than 64,000 souls in a year's time. This very much tracks the experience of Florence with Boccaccio, who noted in his Decameron that more than 100,000 human creatures, it is believed, within the walls of the city of Florence had their lives taken in 1348 and 1349. So just um, absolutely population wiping out events uh, with the plague in Italy. So to return to Manzoni, the final version, as we've heard of, of Manzoni's The Promessi Sposi, saw the light only in 1840, decades after a first draft called Fermo and Lucia, 1821, and nearly 15 years after the novel was first published as Promessi Sposi in 1827. In its narrative, that is, it's a historical narrative, and Italy subjugated by a capricious foreign power, that is, Spain, and in its choice of language, first in Manzoni's Frenchified, Milanese-inflected Italian, and then only later in the 1840 edition in Dante's Florentine, the novel served the cause of the inchoate Italian Risorgimento. The lengthy diatribe against 17th century Spanish rule could be easily grafted on to Lombardy's new 19th century ruler, Austria. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. <laughs> And the language of the novel aimed to achieve a sort of linguistic unification for an Italy in which even 20 years later upon the proclamation of the kingdom of Italy, only 3% of Italians spoke Italian. <laughs> if one mark of a great work and a core text is to be the first or the best source of wisdom for understanding who we are, then there is none more apt than Manzoni's Promessi Sposi so I often call Promessi Sposi a great Catholic novel or a great Italian novel. But in reality, it's a great novel, full stop, full of banal evil, redeeming good, pathos, beauty, exultant joy, conversion. It is a great novel in need of no other adjectives. And this reminds me by an article about Italian philology, of course, by Guglielmo Gorni called Material Philology, Conjectural Philology, Philology Without Adjectives. I'm sure we've all read it. <laughs> in, the, in the few minutes uh, left and allotted to me today, I'd like to explore these parallel pandemics of my title, both within the Italian tradition and without. That is to read Manzoni's Promessi Sposi in light of other Italian examples, such as Boccaccio and Sorrel, as well as against the backdrop of our own response to a public health crisis in 2020 and 21. Parallel pandemic, pandemics then, a doppio senso, the plague and the betrothed as a specular depiction of Boccaccio's Decameron and an important contribution to Italian plague lit and as a demonstration of the constancy of human nature. To read the Promessi Sposi is to understand the present moment, to encounter refreshingly, horrifyingly that is, familiar human and institutional psychological response to crisis. The best literary works we know thread that needle while describing perfectly their time, they somehow give off a universality that lifts them out of the specific time and place in which they were conceived. Just to cite an example that I literally took at random today of Manzoni's insight. And he's, he's talking about plague times. He says, but in general, we men are made in this manner. We revolt indignant and furious against mediocre half ills. And yet we bend over meekly in silence against the extreme ones. We endure, not resigned, but stupid. The peak of that which from the very beginning we had called unbearable. Think about two weeks to flatten the curve, for example. Unlike Boccaccio, however, for whom his novella to be the source of succor and hope was external to despair, Manzoni's plague features death and renewal, tragedy and hope. Yes, callousness, ignorance, and mendacity, but also characters and episodes that illumine, like Dante, who promises to recount not just bitterness of death, but also the beauty he encountered in his journey up to pur purgatory and especially paradise. Manzoni describes the hellish landscape of plague afflicted Lombardy so that he too may show the redeeming nature of Christian faith amidst tragedy. After all, without having heard the strident discordant sounds of hell, would the polyphonic unity of the music in paradise 
have sounded so sweet to Dante characters' ears. And in fact, Manzoni says something similar in chapter 31. He discusses the heroic exploits of Padre Felice, and again, citing the historian Giuseppe Ripamonti, whom we will cite many times, he writes, of a man such as this, that is Padre Felice, he should have spoken just as much if instead of describing only the miseries of a city, he were to have to recount those things that also give it honor, right? Uh, both the bitterness of death, but also the beauty. And we're moving on. So Manzoni in the end, in addition to the other difference that we've already mentioned uh, with respect to Boccaccio, uses the plague to lend historical verisimil verisimilitude to his Walter Scott inspired historical novel. And as he writes in chapter 31, not only to represent the state of the situations in which our characters will find themselves, but also to make familiar a period in our country's history more famous than known, plague pedagogy, in other words. Manzoni aims to correct the record, he writes, for even the best account, that of Ripamonti, there are essential facts omitted and material errors committed. Manzoni avers that no later writer has yet proposed to examine and compare those accounts in order to create a less disjointed history of the plague. Qualcosa che non è stato ancora fatto, something that has yet to be done, says Manzoni. And of course, along the way, he connects the arrival of the plague with that twin calamity, that of the marauding Lanzi Canecchi, one tragedy human, the other natural, that had befallen Lombardy. In chapter 31 at the outset, he says, and I quote, all along the strip of land trod by the army, a short time later in this or then that town, they began to get sick, all right? So what struck me the most about rereading and reteaching Promessi Sposi this past year, because I had the opportunity to teach it in the fall, I had long planned to teach it, but it was a perfect uh, coincidence. Uh, what, struck, what struck me the most, again, was the timelessness and the constancy of the political, institutional, and human reaction to disease and death, which make the novel instructive and illustrative for our own time. So according to Manzoni, how did authorities and citizens respond to the pestilence? As with Boccaccio before him, in Spanish-ruled 17th century Lombardy, Manzoni depicts a culture of abandonment and fear. He cites Ripamonti, who in a precise echo, maybe a, a plagiarism of Boccaccio, tells us that there was something more afflicting and hideous still, reciprocal distrust and extravagant suspicion. And this not only between friends, neighbors, and guests, but husbands, wives, and children became objects of terror to one another. And horrible to even say, the dinner table and the marriage bed were feared as places of ambush, as places fit for the hiding of poison. Mm. This causes me to reflect on what we already saw with Boccaccio, and I reproduced it below, uh, this idea about uh, the loss of fellow feeling, right? Even within families. <clears throat> so Spanish authorities, Lombardy was again under their rule at the time, at first ignored the plague and then took contradictory measures in their largely vain efforts to contain it. It will surprise no one that Manzoni describes initial fiscal policy as, I quote, a time to spend without saving, to attempt every single solution possible. And I believe you'll see this article, the US budget deficit is rising amid COVID-19, but public concern about it is falling. <laughs> So not only that, uh, but scrambling to stave off the twin crises, economic and sanitary, the chancellor, as we've already heard from Bob of Milan, set limits on the sale and purchase of grain and bread and so on and so forth. Well, we saw this when we were unable to purchase more than 12 rolls of toilet paper last March here in Dallas County. Medical advice from the health commission. And though there's a great limit on how much, it's just like the bread of Franklin. There's a great limit on how much. <laughs> That's true. So uh, concurrent with all of this, medical advice from the Tribunal of Health was haphazard and ridiculed and ignored by many. Traditional funeral rites were interdicted. And this happened both in Boccaccio and in Manzoni. Uh, we, see, we read in Boccaccio, but as the ferocity of the plague began to mount, 
This practice all but disappeared entirely and was replaced by different customs. And we have the version uh, in Manzoni below. And of course, we all know what happened last year. Coronavirus is changing the rituals of death for many religions. My own grandmother died last March and her funeral was limited to 10 people. Mm -hmm. So moving on, what followed all of this, of course, was a weakening of human bonds, a loss of mutual trust, the arrival of mass hysteria and even psychosis, all of which Manzoni chronicled with an infernal vocabulary. Literally, he took it from Dante's Inferno. I, I won't go into it. It's part of another uh, presentation and longer essay I'm working on, but his descriptions of Renzo's return to Milan in chapter 34 echo precisely the language used in Inferno 3 and Inferno 5. Um, and so it's an amazing coincidence. So Lombardy and Milan are infernal, right? Um, but then as now in 2020 and 21, the most chilling consequence of the public health crisis and the institutional response to it was that loss of fellow feeling of communitas. For Manzoni, as for Boccaccio before him in the medieval period, the dissolution of a lawfully and rightfully ordered society was a hallmark of said crisis. Um, and both comment on it, and we can see examples in our own age. Boccaccio, in the face of so much affliction and misery, all respect for the laws of God and man had virtually broken down and been extinguished in our city. And Manzoni, in chapter 32, thus during public misfortunes and during the extended disturbances to what is the usual order, an increase, a sublimation of virtue is always seen, but unfortunately, a similar increase in perversity and of a much more widespread nature always accompanies it. And this too was taken note of. So I wanted to now turn a bit more informally to the second aspect of our parallel pandemics in the title, that is how Manzoni's plague mirrors our own present moment. For example, um, in our own present age, new jobs and entire new lines of work have sprung up as a result of market forces and government decrees. These include, among others, Amazon workers, grocery store employees, and the heretofore non-existent contact tracer. During the plague in Milan, new professions also came up. Monati, apparitori, commissari. <laughs> and the notorious monati, though that is the corpse uh, removers, were recruited from among the dregs of society and were charged with, among other things, transporting the sick to the lazaretto, burying the dead, and burning all infected possessions. And this is what the health tribunal had to do. And I quote, they had to replace every day and every day to add to the number of individuals charged with public services of all kinds. Of these individuals, there were three remarkable classes. The first was that of the monati. This appellation of doubtful origin was applied to those men who were devoted to the most painful and dangerous employment in times of contagion. The taking of the dead bodies from the houses, from the streets, and from the lazaretto, carrying them to their graves, burying them, also bringing the sick to the lazaretto, burning and purifying suspected or infected objects. The second class was that of the apparitori, whose special function was to precede the funeral cars, ringing a bell to warn passengers to retire and to get out of the way. The third was that of the commissaries who presided over both the other classes under the immediate orders of the Tribunal of Health. Lest we think that modern health officials and politicians invented the practice of forced quarantines, we have only to cite again Manzoni and the same Tribunal of Health charged with hiring the Monati, Aperitori, and the like. For example, in chapter 32, in advance of a procession to be led by Cardinal Federigo Borromeo, the nephew of Cardinal Carlo Borromeo, hero in his own right of the pandemic or plague of 1576, health authorities ordered those infected confined to their homes. Around 500 homes in Milan had their outside doors and windows nailed shut. That could never happen in 2020. The Tribunal of Health prescribed more strict rules for these people entering the city. And in order to carry out those rules, it had the gates to the city closed, just as it also with the objective to exclude from the gathering those infected and suspected to be infected, had the outside doors to quarantine homes nailed shut. 
Again, it can never happen in 2020. What? Coronavirus. Residents welded inside their homes in China. Yeah. <laughs> Ouch. Yep. Technology advances from Nile. Nile yes, Nile's we've come a long COVID. way, baby. So um, I'm moving towards a somewhat of a conclusion, if there can be said to be one. So in a Milan where 75% of residents would eventually die within a year due to the corona or the, the plague, to whom would be entrusted the care of the sick and dying, or rather who would be crazy enough, brazen enough to accept such a task? The Black Death of 1628-9, as detailed in Promessi Sposi, um, overwhelmed existing rudimentary healthcare networks, which were largely, as we know, church run and staffed by men and women religious. Doctors could be enticed to staff the Lazaretto only if handsome salaries were involved. And even then it was a challenging task. And I don't know if I have that. I have it somewhere, I hope. No, professore, che disastro. Well, va bene. Uh, let's stop the share. I have, it's a great quote, so we've got to find it. Yeah. Give me one moment. I will, I promise I will get there. I feel better now, Anthony. Yeah, no, no, it happens to all of us. Uh, well, okay, well, if I don't find it, that's okay. I'll just read it. So once the, the Lazzaretto was without doctors, and with offers of big pay and titles, with difficulty and not immediately, however, they could be had, but many fewer than were needed. We may recall the nurses traveling to New York City in March for salaries of $10,000 per week, yeah. right? So again, along with the loss of fellow feeling, the near end of all civic life, came the impetus to shame publicly those deemed responsible for spreading the virus. In Milan, those were the so-called untori, the spreaders. They were hunted down mercilessly with a vehemence rivaled only by the shamers of the maskless Sunday shopper, the college party attendee, or the motorcycle rally rider. Manzoni recounts the horrifying story of an elderly man accused of spreading plague on the pews of his church. For his supposed transgression, he was first attacked inside the church by a group of women, after which he was brought outside and killed or nearly, right? Um, and the whole quote is here, you have in front of you, but we know that can never happen in 2020. University of California, Berkeley blames spike in coronavirus cases on frat and sorority parties. <laughs> so it did happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. That could never happen in other parts of the country only probably out in California. Sturgis rally may have caused more than 250,000 new coronavirus cases, study finds. I guess it could happen. <laughs> so in, in 2020 and 21, as in 1348, 1628, 1884, political dictates, decrees, and solutions have been arbitrary, capricious, and worst of all, scientifically dubious. The incompetence of our political and institutional leaders has been rivaled only by the furor of the perfectly overlapping Venn diagram of politics and the virus. This too, alas, is nothing new. In perhaps his most insightful, com insightful comment on the plague-induced frenzy, Manzoni cites his uncle, it pays to have good connections here, Italian Enlightenment thinker Pietro Verri on the desire to place blame amidst a public health crisis. Yeah. And I quote, it pleases the people more to attribute the ills to human perversity against which it is possible to carry out a vendetta than to recognize them as being from a cause with which there is nothing to do but resign oneself. Right, it's just like the hoarders and wreckers. For all, for all of the supposed advances in our scientific society, the pandemic and more so the response to it has made clear that what has been will be again, and what has been done will be done again. And that our much vaunted social and technological advancements are tenuous, if not illusory, in the face of a virus that frankly, historically, pales in comparison to the examples we've seen in the past. The responses to the pandemic on the part of our institutions, whether they be politicians, public health officials, authorities, church hierarchy and citizenry confirm that we really aren't too far removed 
from early modern and medieval habits. And with that, I will conclude. Oh, very nice. Very yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah. Thank okay. you. That was great. Lovely bow. Um, let me um, um, begin with uh, just one little question. And um, um, I'm glad we got all this time, frankly, uh, to hear these things. Um, um, that last quote, um, can we turn it around? And in Manzoni's account of things, there is something to feel, feel the vendetta against, um, namely the conduct of particularly officials, particularly those in charge of making big decisions. And then even the bigger matter of the rule by foreigners who don't have that feeling. Um, and, you know, this would be a way in which the book contributes to a strong sense We've been ruled by others, um, others, others, um, and and you're not going to get um, um, that. Already, you have a split community, um, and you know, and one could e e extend that, and and then one could also turn, particularly, um, I don't know what it means by three powers that the Wuhan virus just doesn't come close. Um, <laughs> uh, but that's the, that's the big thing. Um, and then what has filled it? All these things that resemble um, the mistakes, the follies, and the perversities um, um, that deserve um, a remedy, um, or the, at least indignation. Well, that's just one question. I've got plenty more for others. Christy, I'm going to have to read your whole thing. You answered love and justice. You answered that paragraph of mine, whether we say we shall overcome or carry a on. You really addressed it. I'm going to be digging into that. And uh, well, okay. Um, and um, um, if you want to, uh, Tony, uh, one, um, just I just want to make uh, one comment on. on yeah. Uh, Nuss Meyer's presentation is interesting that um, at, at the end there, when you were talking about the um, uh, kind of popular reactions and, it, it, you know, and Manzoni's extensive on this, of course, um, it's, it, 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 it's far worse than what they were doing in 1628 in the, in the economic crisis, but still looking for informers, um, you know, trying to know everything about everybody and, 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 and finding an individual person who is responsible. Yeah, it's really incredible. It's, it's incredible. I mean, the plague was much worse, of course. I mean, just way beyond. Yeah. But still, we had, yes, we had, um, I remember um, Massachusetts was actually going to recruit um, informers, contract tracers that the doctor Black mentioned. And and train them. So at any time you went anywhere, you'd be you could be contact traced, which is what the Chinese did too. Yeah, they're already they already have that social credit app. Right, uh, right, yeah. right. And you know, it's not it's not even tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theory anymore. Uh, the the parallels are really uh, quite scary to to and, and are revealed, uh, I think, in in Manzoni. Uh, better yeah. than anywhere else I, I've ever seen. And he's, uh, and you're right, there's much more to add about these parallels. He is, he's merciless in his criticism of first the authorities for not believing that the, the pest, the pestilence was there. Uh, right. Because ta he mentions Tadino and some others who are in, in Ripamonti and others accounts who have, who were trying to sound the alarm and say, look, this thing is here. Uh, it's real. And the authorities um, were, were very much lackadaisical and said, Oh, we don't need to do anything. It's probably it's probably just the seasonal whatever's changing of seasons, you know, right? Um, but then he's also merciless uh, on the other hand with those recommendations made by the authorities once they did accept the that the that the pest was was present, um, and he says that the 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 expertise, um, the knowledge of the experts combined with the the populace 
com uh, all came together to create, he says, um, an, en an enormous confused mass of <laughs> public craziness. He says, una massa enorme e confusa di pubblica folia. Um, and he, he's very, very merciless with the, the scientists and the doctors, uh, as, was, as was Boccaccio. I mean, you can read in Boccaccio that he basically calls them, you know, doctors who got their degree on Facebook, as we would say today. He said that the number of, the number of men multiplied exponentially uh, during uh, the plague in, in 14th century and also in Manzoni in the 17th century. Um, so we really don't ever change. It's the constancy of human nature uh, that, that jumps out at me. Um, and of course, I was looking for these parallels after, but when I was teaching the novel uh, in the fall, they just were coming one after another. Um, not just that, but um, there was virtue signaling, for example, on the part of authorities. Um, he mentions, Manzoni mentions, I think at the end of chapter 32, that um, for um, a festival, it was common to go out to the cemetery. Um, just like they used to do in later centuries, they used to actually have picnics out of the cemetery. And it just so happened that there was a family of like seven that had, all of which had succumbed to the, the plague that day and they had to be buried. And so the public authorities arranged for the cart carrying all seven bodies to be brought out to the cemetery while everybody else was frolicking so that they could say to the deniers, uh, we would call them, right, the negazionisti, um, look, this thing is real. Look what's going on. We're burying these people. Um, and it was a very, um, we would call it a very mediatico, something very much mediatico. It was, it was done by the a media um, to show that this thing is real and it was a spectacle made of it. It was, it was incredible. The, the other, the other but, but wait a second. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, uh, the, the, um, the comment about how um, uh, the populace became very worked up over relatively modest ills and then, and then ignored uh, the really catastrophic situation. Um, and I, I think you were presenting that in the context of, of, of the plague situation as it got worse and worse and worse. But I think he, he has the same observation in the 1628 economic crisis too. The, the, um, they were all up in arms, you know, looting everything and, and, and going crazy because the bakers are hoarding flour supposedly. But then uh, later in the, in the, in the, in the, before the plague, when, when all the whole countryside comes into Milan because the price is fixed and, and um, it induces a pestilence from unsanitary conditions, yeah. walk right by. They, in the sense, yeah. Phenomena. They just walk right by sick people. I think you do really well to make the connection between what I was saying about that, about the plague, and about the tumulto di San Martino, because you quoted um, that, you know, it was really regretful that Renzo fell into the common opinion, right? Uh, Manzoni says that. Manzoni, Manzoni's... Right. right. And, and you cited that. And in fact, in chapter 32, he uses the same phrase to describe the reaction to the plague. He says... Il buon senso c'era, ma se ne stava nascosto per paura del senso comune. There was good sense, but it remained hidden for fear of the common opinion. Ha. And, and he makes that connection between uh, what you just cited, uh, the, the economic crisis and the health crisis. Right. The economic crisis being, relatively speaking, trivial, as it turns out, in reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, on the one point of parallel, um, you cited the similarity of early denial of the possible seriousness of the illness, the virus coming your way. And of course, in Mazzoni, it, you know, it's the plague. And, um, um, but, and we had early denial from WHO from the Chinese, from Fauci, et cetera. But then the stories aren't parallel because looks to me and some people I um, that the virus and you cited the figures um, um, is it's worse than most flus, but it's nowhere near a plague. 
and yet you have all these measures taken so that um, um, it's a, let me put it this way, the parallels cease to exist, but the bad conduct is what unites them. The yeah, I think you're, you're, you're certainly right. It, you know, the, the coronavirus exists. It's What's scary about it or was initially is that it was novel. It was something unknown. And we, and we do fear the unknown, just as we did in the medieval period of the 17th century. Um, and, and yes, we also have to account for the fact that healthcare is much better, that mortality rates overall were much higher back in the day. But the point is, yes, this is not the plague. I mean, that, let's get that out of the way right now. Um, and so while the, the health consequences sort of um, cease to exist, the reaction uh, to those possible consequences don't. And I think a lot of that is aided by the fact that we have to keep in mind, this was the first social media pandemic, where if I'm you know, a random American in Peoria, Illinois, I can get on Facebook and tell my story to everyone. And all of a sudden it feels a lot closer to me. Um, and, and I think that's probably driving a lot of it as well. Uh, and, and so, you know, reading Manzoni and going back and reading Boccaccio has, has given me um, a different perspective on our current moment. And, and one that has helped me cope, speaking of consolation uh, in a time of, and crisis, I think these, these texts really do give consolation, whether it's intellectual or whether it's for the affect, I don't know, but some sort of consolation. Mm. Well, you, you know what it is, it, it's partly, um, um, it was even worse then. And also this too will pass. We've, see, we've seen this story before. Um, I, can, I can say yeah. that, that one interesting, um, aspect of, of the coronavirus is the huge differential in mortality rates uh, by age. Um, and it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, essentially uh, zero uh, deaths. Mm -hmm. Anyone under about, say, 15 who, who actually contracts the virus. Extremely modest, well, up to 65 or so. And at, at 80, with any underlying conditions, it's huge. And I, I can report um, where, where I am with the demographics where I am. There are many, many uh, seniors who are absolutely petrified. Um, uh, one, one of my wife's um, acquaintances has almost literally not left her house in a year. And she's, you know, um, uh, we and, have, and she's, she's and fine, and I, but- And I can certainly understand that more than I can someone my age not Yeah, no, exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. But you see, I, I've seen people riding in air-conditioned cars with the windows up, wearing masks. <laughs> and what's most grieving to me is driving by our elementary school out here in the valley I'm in, and children playing outside with masks on. Yeah. Outside. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I just. My, uh, my favorite. My favorite image was um, from one one of the media sources. Uh, alarm, alarmist type things was was um, a, a woman uh, uh, in 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 the beach at the beach, but in the water, kind of kind of frolicking, splashing around in Florida, wearing a mask. Now the thing is, when when the when the cloth mask, I'm not talking about a you know a high tech N95 mask here that used in the emergency room. This is this is like a bandana type mask uh, for all practical purposes. When it gets wet, it isn't effective anymore. It stops being effective. Secondly, salt water kills the virus. It's, 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 it's chloride. And thirdly, you're outside in the sunshine in, in, in Florida, which also kills the virus. But yet they were promoting this no. mask frolicking in the water. If, if we go back to Pacho, that if we go back to the camera on. Um, Early on, we didn't know enough about it, okay? So is it transferred on surfaces? Hey, maybe so. But we they did knew, learn- They knew, they knew within, within two months that that wasn't true. Yes, yeah. yes, I know. And the, yeah. the particles were absolutely tiny. But well, we knew from pictures, the people who were really worried, a nurse in the ER, what were they wearing? Not just in 95, it looked like they're going to land on Mars, for God's yes. sake. Um, yes. what, what, what's the reasonable assumption from that? It's nice. It shows goodwill. 
but it's very and it's virtuous <laughs> yeah. but that's it well um, in boccaccio's um, time the camera on he cites competing medical uh concilia uh one camp said that you should be abstemious to avoid uh getting the plague and, and becoming sick and the other camp said that you should actually become knee walking drunk to use a, a boston maybe a area <laughs> three and that that was the best way to ward off uh, this illness. And so we laugh now, but, you know, we'll probably be laughing, uh, certainly in 700 years time, but, but even sooner, we'll be laughing about some of the things that we did um, to sort of ward off this latest iteration of an unknown novel virus, you know? So uh, again, in Boccaccio's time, it was, it was alcohol. Um, in, Manz in Manzoni's time, it was, well, there wasn't a whole lot they could do other than nail people inside of their homes and burn infected possessions. Um, in our own time, it's social distancing um, and so forth. Yeah. Well, the, the other thing following up on the distinction of who's vulnerable, the old and the older you are more, um, the, the subordinate distinctions. I remember Mrs. Bricks and I loved her scarves um, admitting we count dying from it as the same, uh, dying with it as the same as dying from it. I, there was a doctor in Minnesota who said, I'm, a, I'm now asked to sign more death certificates violating all the rules I've always been taught. Wow. Um, the other thing is obesity. Um, you don't hear much about it, but that's a big distinction and, uh, and exactly the way it goes, other than that you have breathing difficulties, you have all sorts of other vulnerabilities in this way. Yeah, um, and the, nobody wants to, to discuss that much. Yeah, the, the two biggest comorbidities are obesity and diabetes, which are themselves linked. Yeah. Yeah, so we have, you know, we have much more knowledge. We have much more knowledge. As you said it, uh, Bob, it may be worse these days because we do possess more, more knowledge. It's not yeah. that we, you know, I, I poke fun at our overly scientific society, but it's truth that we have accumulated much more science. Oh, yeah, no question. Right? Um, and, and so maybe we have even less excuse to, to do things that are scientifically dubious. But um, again, it, it provides great reflection to read about this in, in Manzoni. And, yeah. and to see how he discusses from a variety of perspectives, the, the reaction to the measures taken, um, the measures not taken and the measures taken, right? Because he, he does criticize both sides, right? Those who, who would say it doesn't exist, those who were too late to react. Um, he says time and again that, uh, oh yeah, no, that's just normal swamp fever, right? Or uh, something like that. Uh, that's just what happens when the people come in from the countryside um, and that and that we should really be more attentive to this thing. Um, and then on the other hand, you know, he, he does decry the sort of some of the more draconian measures taken uh, that deprived uh, the Milanese of any sort of communitas uh, yeah. in, yeah. in the family. And but despite it all, what's as I try to get to um, the the difference between Boccaccio and Manzoni is that Manzoni provides for hope in that despair, right? We have these beautiful scenes when they go to the Lazzaretto, both with Renzo and Don Rodrigo and Renzo and Lucia being reunited, uh, which also illustrate not just the hope amidst the despair and the tragedy, but also the capacity for redemption and for mercy uh, above all else, right? Don Rodrigo, does he undergo a deathbed Napoleonic Esque or Napoleon esque conversion, maybe, maybe not. But do Renzo and Lucia show him an amount of mercy that perhaps we would think from an outsider's mm -hmm. perspective he doesn't deserve? Right. Um, and, and so part of what, what gets Manzoni um, in my corner, even over Boccaccio, is that Boccaccio's novelle are extrinsic to the story of the plague for the most part, right? Uh, whereas it's crucial to the narrative in Manzoni and for the arc from the despair of the interrupted marriage to everything else to have this reconciliation and then this extreme mercy shown um, and extreme charity on the part of 
Fra Cristoforo and Padre Felice and some of the other men and women religious um, uh, towards the end in the last three chapters. And it's really just an incredible text, uh, uh, an incredibly rich text that does recommend it um, for, for wider reading and, and more a more broad airing. And I'm, I'm a person because I'm an Italianist. You have to take what I say with a, a grain of salt, but. Well, I, I for one had never heard of it and I'm thrilled that, that we read it. Excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt. Yeah, we're, we're done, right? Yeah, you may have seen my messages. We've uh, talked to Mr. you mute yourself. The Boccaccio turning to telling stories up in Fiesole, which mm. are distractions from the seriousness of what was going on. Yeah. Uh, every one of those speakers with those droll and worse than droll stories should be turned back to the betrothed, but also yeah. Um, yeah. Our ruling class, I expected the New York Times, you see at one time to have a big headline. Despite progress, it has been discovered death still exists. <laughs> yes. yes, that's right. It does. It the does. mortality <laughs> rate's 100%. And, and, and then, and then. A, one is just a, one. And then We're some done. presidential candidate to announce when I get in, by God, we're going to spend trillions to eliminate this thing, death. Um, and it's just the opposite of what the rich, the deep richness of the book about, not ju about justice, but about in Dr. Michael, I think we're being kicked out. We're being kicked yes. out here. Well, that, that's yes. why I tried to bring us back to Christie's paper and, yeah. you know, to that issue. And, uh, well, yeah. yeah. We, sh we should distribute well, we them. The yes, you the can recording. distribute them. There's also uh, in in Sosa, uh, there's the option to do the mingle feature if you'd like to uh, speak more on this, uh, either this no, evening no or has places later. To go. <laughs> I do. No, I it's more like my superiors are uh, yeah. giving me the I word, understand. right? Thank um, you so much and, for helping uh, us here. You're very yeah. welcome. Happy to do it. Uh, it was a pleasure listening in. I'm unfamiliar with anything, you, uh, any of these texts you have to discuss. <laughs> no, thanks to all. Uh, and, uh, very, very nice presentations, Christy and, and